So one of the things you mentioned in the book that you thought that China was the biggest threat to America since the Revolutionary War. That eliminates the Civil War, that eliminates World <laughs> War II. So tell us about that focus, because that's, that's a strong statement about the threat yeah, we threat It's meant China's to be, had. if you were going to make any, any modification to it, you would say uh, the War of 1812, right, maybe, because there we were fighting a nation that had almost as that had a bigger economy than ours at that time. So I say that because one, they are clearly hostile. And they're hostile not only to the United States because we're number one and they want to be number one, but because they find our system of democratic freedom to be a bad system. Right. So so they're they're the, the Chinese themselves tend to be xenophobic anyway, right? They tend to be very, very focused on themselves. They built a wall. Yeah, yeah. Although, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But that wasn't to keep people in. No. But, 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 uh, but I take your point. Um, so, so the Chinese uh, are, by their own words, they're very hostile to us. Um, and and the, the reference really there is not only to the hostility, because we've had hostile adversaries, but also to the size of the threat. So they have a population that's multiples of ours. They have a GDP that is much closer to ours, for example, than the combination of Germany and Japan together in the Second World War. So we've never really faced an adversary that was as close to us in economic strength, much bigger in population, approaching, if not the same as us, in technology, um, and, and really devoted to a global scheme of, of hurting the United States, of becoming number one. And, and that's what their military does. You know, they intimidate us. That's what they... they they uh, steal our technology, they, they woo our businesses, they try to influence our, our academics and our, and our students, their diplomacy, the so-called wolf warriors go around the, uh, the world very hostile to the United States. So um, th they are clearly a hostile force and, and that was more reference to size. Really since the revolution, the only time we fought anyone who was, who was remotely our size um, was was the, what some would call the, the second revolution of the War of 1812. That it's funny, I use the same analogy in my book. I would say 1812, that war was the closest to what we have right now with yeah. China. And, I, and I, I think that's, you know, that's... But, but even in that, was the threat as great as it is now? So I would say, even in the War of 1812, the economies were the same. But, but remember, for part of that, um, um, the UK is fighting... France. Right. I mean, we, we see all these things in our own way, and you say, well, what happened? Why did they come and, and finally, after a stalemate in that war, uh, end up coming and burning Washington? Well, it's, they got rid of Napoleon. So they, I mean, there's, you know, they, so that was a difficult time for sure. But, but even that wasn't a threat, and this was not a threat to the way we think and our system of government and our. Our, our businesses and our, our population. That, you know, that was the question there was never going to be whether what we think of as the, the, the basic American way was never at risk there. So people talk a lot right now about decoupling or de-risking, and they're different. De-risking says we have to diversify supply chains, we can't be so reliant. Decoupling says we need to get away from them. So. Tell us how you see those two issues and where you, you come down on that. Well, for me, I am an advocate of what I call strategic decoupling. And in the first place, I don't know when I hear things like uh, we want a you know, small yard, high wall, we want uh, de-risking. I, I, ne I never know quite what that means. Is, does that mean that uh, in order to build our F-35, we want to have a source of chips overseas, but other than China. I mean, that, if, if that's de-risking, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty small de-risk, right? So de-risking tends to me to be kind of a cop-out, right? You either acknowledge the level of the problem, mm -hmm. and then you act, or you say, 
there are forces around here. I don't either understand how serious the problem is, which is the case for some people. They just don't believe it. And, and those people I, I worry about. Or they say, well, we can put up in this existential competition with a certain amount of risk. And that strikes me as, as dangerous thinking. So the way, the way I calculate it is we, I'm not for no trade. I'm not for um, no economic connection, for sure. But I, I, I think about strategic decoupling as follows. One, you put in place tariffs to get to balance trade. So when you think about this, a lot of people think about our competition with China. They think in terms of the military. They think in terms of technology. But what they miss is that we're also transferring to them hundreds of billions of dollars in net worth in, in, our, in, our, in our wealth. So let me add that up a little bit. So we're running a trade deficit. We can talk about the meaning of trade deficits later if you like. But we're running a trade deficit, which basically transfer, you can do different numbers, but say, the 350 or so billion dollars a year. That's wealth that the United States has that we're giving to them uh, because of the imbalance. But in we trade. get something in return. Well, yes, but but we, and we'll talk about that because it's good to talk about that. But it, the question in is building their army worth cheap T-shirts. But we can focus on that. Let me let me try to say what the wealth transfer is. Because uh, it's important to, to do what you're, what you're saying. It's important to talk about trade deficits as they are. But let me just make this point. So we, we are transferring wealth to them, largely for consumables, but for other reasons. There's probably another $150 billion of wealth that we're transferring to them that, that happens because we don't keep track of. There's a, a, a loophole in the way we keep our statistics. is so-called de minimis, which I won't go into unless someone's interested. And then in addition, we're transferring, by our estimates, say $300 billion in technology that they steal from us. Uh, in addition, we are transferring some additional wealth to them through other countries like Vietnam where they're transshipping. And then in addition to that, there is some amount of billions of dollars that is transferred to China because of the precursors to fentanyl that they sell to Mexico that come to the United States. So when you add it all up, no one knows what the number is, but the number is certainly five, six, seven hundred billion dollars. So if you do that every year to someone you, who you acknowledge is an existential threat and an opponent, and someone who I would suggest is hostile, that strikes me as just a completely stupid policy. Um, you, If you look at what they spend on their Army and Navy, it's less than we ship to them. If you, if you look at what they spend on their technology, it's less than what we ship to them. If you look at what their economic growth is and, and say they have a $17 trillion economy and they're going to grow at 5%, that's about what we're shipping to them. And to ship that after you've made the initial assessment of the threat strikes me as a very bad policy. And the de-risker saying, well, we're going to do a lot of that. We're going to ship all, most all that money anyway, uh, even though we've made the assessment about how bad they are. It strikes me as a very, very weak policy. So I'm for strategic decoupling. And I ask, you know, that's balanced trade. It's disentangling technology, which we could do over a period of time, both of these over a period of time. And then I would, I would put restrictions on outgoing investment, because all the investment that comes from the United States and goes to China is net in China's favor. Because if it wasn't, they wouldn't let it in, right? I mean, it's not like this is a market. And, and their technology coming here, I would severely restrict. I mean, uh, investments coming here, I would severely restrict because that also is net in their favor or they wouldn't do it. So I think if you did those things, you phased it over a period of time, you would get to a point where you had trade, you would stop shipping money and, and, and wealth to an opponent and in the long run, combined with sensible things like building up our own economy, subsidizing chips, building our army, those things would put us in a position where we would prevail. And the greatest deterrent really will be the, the notion that we would in fact prevail. So, so that's where I am on that. I, the the, the, the um, uh, sort of de-risking is, 
it's like uh, a half or a tenth measure. It's what somebody does if they're in a committee and, and can't quite come to agreement on things. And so they say, well, we don't want to annoy this group of billionaires who makes a lot of money importing, and we don't want to annoy that group of billionaires who makes a lot of money on technology. So we're going to, rather than have a plan to get us to even trade in technological independence, rather than that, we're going to kind of do half measures and compromise and try to get the whole committee on board. And, and you know, typically that's not the best answer.